welcome everyone. I'm Melissa Jules with RDA. We are extremely excited to have Mike Anderson of Collision Advice with us today. Mike is here to fill us in on what does 2021 look like for collision repair. In this presentation, Mike Anderson, along with Ray Chu of CCC, will share brand new material on what the state of the industry is as we close out 2020, and more importantly, what to prepare for for 2021. The presentation will take approximately 70 to 75 minutes, depending on questions. We are recording it and we'll post it on our YouTube channel. If you do have questions during the webinar, you can type them in the chat box at the bottom right of your screen and Mike will answer them during the presentation. Now, I'll turn it over to Mike. Hey, thank you, Melissa. And thank you everybody for joining us today. So first of all, happy December 2nd, 23 days left to Christmas. So make sure you're on the good list, not the naughty list. Let me just give a shout out to some people that I see on here. Uh, let me just scroll up to the top of this attendee list. Oh my gosh. I got I got Mr. Dwayne Bullard from the, the Big Island. Dwayne, hey man, love you, brother. Miss you. Hope all those kids are doing well. Brian from Highline, shout out to you, my brother. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're still playing music. And we got Greg Schneider, guy who keeps driving that Porsche. We get a oh, we got Miss Leisha Santiago from Highline. That's like family. And then I got Roy Chandler, man, brother. You don't write, you don't call, you don't send me no Facebook messages. Oh, Robert Collins is on the line. Man, we got a ton of friends on the call today, Mr. Chu. Oh, we got Steve from the great state of Louisiana. Steven from Mike and Jerry's, brother. Late, love you. Hope you're taking care of Frank for me. So listen, everybody, this is Mike Anderson along with my good friend, Mr. Ray Chu. And we are here today to help you shake off some of that COVID funk, all right? We're going to shake off that. So, Ray, let's just, Ray, just shake off some of that COVID funk, right? I asked Ray Chu to do this in my last webinar. They said they thought Ray was doing a chicken dance. So let's jump into this, y'all. If y'all got some questions, please fire them up in the questions panel. So thank you, Melissa, for handling it, having us. So first of all, my name is Mike Anderson. I'm the owner of Collision Advice, and I have along with me Mr. Ray Chu of CCC. Ray, can you give us a shout out so we know that your microphone and everything's working, my brother? Yeah, thank you. And excuse me, everyone, uh, privilege to be with you today. And uh, Melissa, thank you for preparing us, and we look forward to uh, exceeding your expectations in the webinar. Back to you, Mike. Thank you, sir. So hey, we always got to start with I trust. Bear with me as I read this. I'm going to read this like an auctioneer. It's going to be fast. Bear with me. It's to keep us all out of jail because I don't look good in orange. Antitrust guidelines. It is understood that in today's webinar, we will not discuss any issues that would violate antitrust guidelines. Avoiding violations of the antitrust laws is a responsibility and legal obligation of the business owner alone. Any discussion of current prices or discounts with a competitor should be avoided. In our industry, this includes discounts, time hourly rates, charges to insurance companies, individuals, fleet owners, dealers, or other shops that repair vehicles. Surveys of prices, discount, and cost are permissible, but only under strict guidelines and only they're not part of a conspiracy to fix prices or otherwise restrain trade. Cost studies that lead to price, <coughs> excuse me, price fixing or price stabilized agreements would violate both the United States and Canadian antitrust laws. Remember, the prices you charge must be calculated and determined by you, the business owner alone. These prices should take into account the cost of doing business and include allowances for a reasonable profit. All content in this webinar is based on standard economic and management principles. Profit margins, labor rates, et cetera, used in this presentation are to be taken as examples only. And the intent of this webinar workshop is to provide attendees with basic management skills, leaving you free to determine your own individual rates, profit percentages, and other operating management aspects of their businesses on a strictly independent basis using generally accepted management principles. We've got to get that out of the way all the time, ladies and gentlemen. That's just to protect us. We're not here to discuss any pricing. Any data I share with you is strictly for seminar purposes. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit today. What we're going to do, we're going to talk a bit about some industry statistics. I mean, anytime I want to get my pulse on what's going on in regards to data, I always turn to my friend, Mr. Ray, the data whisperer, Chew. So Ray's going to give us some statistics about claims count. Now, Ray, we got some peeps on here and some family from Hawaii. So I hope you're going to show them the love, Ray. All right. Then we're going to talk a little bit about the importance of understanding financial statements. All right. Understanding financial statements. We're going to talk a little bit about paint materials reportings. And then we're going to talk about the importance of diversification. Yeah, you heard me say it right. Diversification. We're going to talk a little bit about calibrations, doing your own glass uh, in-house, and, and just opportunities with dealerships. So we got a lot of smoking hot content for you. So buckle up. Buckle up. So, Mr. Chu, let's talk about the elephant in the room. COVID. Man, I'll tell you what. COVID hit hard, hit hard, right, in March. But when COVID hit, most shops, when it hit in March, they still had about a month's backlog of work. 
So most shops really didn't feel it till about April, kind of around May, right? Then around April, May, shops started feeling the pinch. And then what happened was we got about July, and guess what? People started traveling. They were out, they didn't have to social distance outside, and they started traveling, taking vacations. And, and what happened was we saw that you know claims count kind of went back up, and shops kind of got into a good place. And now it seems like we're kind of getting back into that COVID funk again, right? With what's going on. So Ray. Let's talk about the elephant in a room, Ray. And Ray, can you go ahead and advance the next slide and give me some statistics about claims count with COVID? Yeah, so thanks, Mike. Uh, I think CCC well brought, uh, 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 processed about 18 million claims this year. And so what we wanted to do here was just take a look at what's going on with claim volume uh, in, in your particular region. So what we're looking at is the same insurers year over year. So let's say a new insurer came to CCC, an example, American Family. We're not going to include this in the data. We just want to uh, compare claim count year over year with the same insurers. And we're also looking at collision and liability only. So what does that not include, Mike? Comprehensive, right? Act of God, hail. So looking at collision and liability, the things that we can count on. And we're looking at a couple of different time periods. And this was pulled, uh, Melissa, Melissa uh, had us, we were doing a dry run, and thank you again for that, Melissa, uh, in late November. Uh, but we are looking at a 24% decline year to date across the nation. We know claim count is local, right? So we, we see the islands have been affected more. Uh, last time I looked, they were down about 30%. California down 28, but we can see Louisiana uh, down at 17%. So it gives you an idea. So what does that mean? So if you were receiving 100 claims from an insurer, let's say, uh, uh, for a year, we would expect that you would have approximately 76 claims this year. That, so just showing what that decline is, and then you can kind of take a look at that from there. So, so now, uh, as, we, as we look at this, and we look about what, what's happening, and we start thinking about 2021, really, uh, there's, there's the latest, there are a lot of factors that are positive and positive direction, right? Uh, we are dealing with this next phase of the pandemic, and so we're going to call those headwinds. But behind it, there's a lot of things to be really positive about. So what I wanted to do today with the audience was to bring up three items, three items that we could do, and we could turn these lemons into lemonade, Mike. And so I'm going to go ahead and get started there. And the, our first thing we're going to talk about is shifting left. Now, shift left uh, began with software developers. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to bring quality control earlier in the process to have a better product and a quicker product to market at the end. So shift left was about moving things upstream, making the point of decision upstream. So now we're going to do a couple examples of that in our industry. But first, to really reinforce the point, let's take a look. Let's talk here about Omnichannel. So, Omnichannel is how the consumer is engaging, right? And now, because of COVID and, and people's concerns about being out and face-to-face -face engagements, um, what we're seeing is, is there are multiple ways a consumer can engage a collision repairer, right? Uh, we know there's always been the phone. There's less in-person, right? So I heard Mike Anderson was talking about photo estimating long before COVID happened, right? And Mike's whole point about photo estimating was, is not to write a damage appraisal. Photo estimating is a capture or a triage tool. But what's really the rave right now, Mike, is web-based appointments. We've seen multiple insurers go to web-based appointments, and the consumer can get in, schedule, and, 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 and it streamlines that whole process and makes it shift left. So as we begin with this first topic here, we're talking omni-channel, and we're talking about how that impacts and how we can shift left to do things a little bit sooner in the process. So let's take a look at Starbucks, right? One of my favorite places to frequent. And back in the day, right, we, we arrive, we do our order, we wait and pick it up. But then Starbucks developed their app and they came up with a new process. So now we can order remotely and we don't have to wait. We just walk in there and pick it up. So this is an example of shifting left and doing something earlier in the process. 
So we think about COVID, many of us have less staff than we did. So how do we think differently? How do we use, how do we leverage technology? How do we become more efficient, right? And turn these lemons into lemonade. So let's talk a little bit more about scheduling in our industry, right? So today there's, a, there's an incident, first notice of loss, a call, a report, an assignment, the shop has to call again, and then we schedule and the vehicle arrives, right? One of the things we did at CCC is overall claim satisfaction in our industry is extremely high. But we went through 7,000 folks, had a company, the Kinsey and Company do this for us, and they put these people through a battery of questions. And what we found is customer satisfaction early on in the process or in the leftmost part of the process when the incident first occurs is at its lowest level, right? So the customer, the customer is confused, doesn't know what to do. So how do we shift left? How do we shift left? Well, now we, uh, we have shops and insurers sharing their calendar. The incident comes in via a report. The insurance company can share that part of the calendar that the shop is authorized and the consumer can book an, an estimate appointment or a repair appointment. I'll say that again, Mike. There's a new feature in CCC1. All you have to do is enable it, everyone, and you can book a repair appointment. So we think so, about shifting left. Go ahead, Mike, please. Yeah, so, so you know what? When we talk about COVID, Ray, you know, there, there is absolutely a silver lining to this cloud, right? Because you think about scheduling, right? Scheduling was one of the most difficult things for us as collision repairers to wrap our heads around, right? You know, we tell that customer, hey, I need you to bring your car in. We knew that we need to schedule and stagger our drop-offs, like one at eight, one at 10, one at 12, one at two. But what happened was when the customer said, oh man, I can't do two o'clock, I'm about to take off from work. And we'd be like, all right, you can bring in eight o'clock in the morning. We sucked at staggering our scheduling. But here's the deal, COVID gives us the perfect excuse to stagger our drop-offs because we can tell the customer we're doing it to protect them for social distancing. So Mrs. Jones or Mr. Chu, you know what? We need to take and stagger our drop-offs to comply with social distancing regulations. And so right now we already have somebody coming in at eight, we got somebody coming in at nine. So our next appointment to allow for social distancing is 10. So ladies and gentlemen, understand a positive from COVID is it gives us the ability to have an excuse or a reason or a justification to stagger our drop-offs so we have time to write a proper repair plan and just some of the vehicle. And again, listen to what Mr. Chu said. For those of you using CCC, you have the ability to turn on appointments so that insurers can see your availability and schedule customers in for you to fill capacity. So don't delay. Turn this feature on today. Back to you, Mr. Chu. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And, and what we're seeing as we look across the industry, 30% uh, of the appointments are coming in through car -wise. Uh, 20 percent is coming in uh, from the collision repairs own website and so what does that mean it means people are googling right auto body near me and they're finding it through car wise and things like that but you absolutely you absolutely want to consider this this point of online scheduling and and uh, and bringing this bringing this uh, upstream and shifting left the responsibility and allowing the consumer to come to come straight in and have that appointment inside of your shop now, um, it becomes such a big deal that, Mike, I was watching TV this weekend, and I saw Geico doing a commercial about their app and collision appointments. I'm like, what? People are in accidents once every seven years. Why is Geico advertising that now? Well, here it is. J.D. Power, the industry guru, right, is saying the consumer is more happy when they schedule online than any other process. Any other process. I have shops that I work with. They yelled at me when CCC first came out with this feature. We have a call center. What are you doing? You're going to mess this up. But no, when you remove human being interruption and just allow people to utilize the systems and their phones like they do and everything else, whether it's open table or restaurant, is actually going to be better. And now that this number 909 has hit the presses, you're going to see more insurers jumping on this. And, and once again, not just for insurers, right? All our other work, right? Want to have the ability uh, to engage to engage the public and let them be able to schedule appointments yeah, in that yeah. way. Yeah, so, so Mr. Chu, let me, 
Go ahead, Mr. Chu. Yes, so I can tell you that I was on a call two weeks ago with a large major insurer. I was on a call this past Monday, is in two days ago, with a major insurer. And I will tell you, because of concerns of COVID spiking, for example, Allstate, they're going to pull all their people back out of the field and not allow anyone back in their offices until next July. Yeah, you heard me say it, next July. Another major insurer said, look, we're pulling all our people back out of the field. So understand, ladies and gentlemen, that right, wrong, or indifferent, the insurance companies are going to pull their people out of the field. Maybe you're not seeing it yet, but you're going to see it. And so they're going to be sending you more work as a DRP. But if you're not a DRP, you can still receive assignments through CCC's open shop and have the ability to write an estimate. So make sure that you've got this scheduling feature turned on. Back to you, Mr. Chu. Yeah, it's a good point, Mike. And not only insurance companies, right? It's the holidays, Mike. You mentioned Christmas earlier, right? Uh, there are going to be a lot of companies that want to send someone to your shop and, and bring you gifts, donuts, cookies, whatever the case is. But do we really want other people coming into our business right now to potentially, potentially negatively uh, impact the health of our employees, right? We have to protect our staff. And so we really have to think about how these interactions are occurring and we and we need to kind of pull back on that a little bit. The other thing I, I think is really important for our shops to know, and this is something the suppliers on the call can actually do, is the feedback we're getting from CCC across the industry from consumers today is that sometimes the consumers are on the website, then they come into the shop, and the shop is not saying the same thing that's on the website. Think about omni-channel. So for our suppliers in the audience, your observations and feedback that you have from the shops, what you're observing and how they interact, how phones are picked up, can be really good because the shop owners, right, we kind of get locked into the day-to-day -day and sometimes we need a fresh set of eyes. So once again, bring consistency to your omni-channel that, that what we're communicating uh, via the phone, via the web, via a photo estimate is the same. And in all three of those, we want to be really prompt in our responses. And we'll talk more about that here in just, just one second. And Mike, something has happened. I have lost control of being able to, oh, there we go. Thank you. All right. So um, what I wanted to talk about now is the CCC DRP and Open Shop Network. And one of the things that we like to do is categorize things by method of inspection. So for our purposes, we're going to look from 2017 to 2020, and we're going to talk about photo estimating. Now, in 2017, photo estimating was 4.3% of all claims. In 2020, it moved to 16.7. Now, it's almost 22%. So we're seeing rapid, rapid adoption of this tool. And what, what is going to be really cool about this for our shop is uh, that utilize photo estimating is CCC has added an enhancement that the insurance company can send the images with the photo estimate. So think about that. You know, why do I care if I'm a shop? Well, now I get to look at, I have, I have a little bit more information before the vehicle comes in, right? It helps me triage, helps with scheduling. So you'll see more and more of that in, in 2021. But when we start thinking about, you know, 18 million claims, a shift of this nature of 15, 16% over a couple of years is tremendous. I, I've never seen such a shift in such a short time period in my career at CCC. So anyways, adoption of it. The thing about photo estimates for everyone on the call on uh, your tip of the day is, uh, is, is, is response time. Consumer sends in a photo estimate. What we're seeing at CCC, if you respond in less than four hours, capture is in the 60% neighborhood. If you respond longer than four hours, capture plummets to the 20s, right? So you want to be really prompt, the same way if someone sends you a text message, it's expected, right? You want to be really prompt on your, on your uh, uh, response to the consumer via a photo estimate. Okay, and here we go. So uh, a couple of last notes on omni-channel. 83% of consumers re require a positive experience. So that means whether it's on the phone, whether we're engaging via the web, whether we're engaging via photo estimate, it's going to be really important 
that our people are dialed in and living in the moment, focused only on the needs of that consumer. And I think it's hard, right? Our generation, we've been multitaskers, right? I just saw Mike a moment ago with his cell phone. I, I'm getting text messages right now. Like, it's just really hard, but, but we have to be focused on that customer. Now, 49% of consumers are more likely to purchase from retailers to send personalized content. Well, why would, I, why would I share that with you folks? That means the automobile, their second largest investment has been brought to you, right? And think about it. One of the questions I always ask when I'm in body shops, in lobbies, is uh, to a consumer that's out, is like, what do you like best about your automobile? And it doesn't matter. Anyone I've ever asked that question is more than 100 times. Like, they always have something in particular, right? You make a note of that. You put it in the file. When the consumer comes and picks it up, I live in Sacramento, California. It gets a little warm. I love the, my seat coolers, right? And you say, hey, Mr. Chu, I checked, and your seat coolers, the seat coolers are working, person, are working perfectly. That's how you personalize content. If I'm doing a photo estimate, I'm, I'm in, in contact with the consumer about bringing the vehicle in, right? Uh, if you go to, uh, we all have access to the owner's manual through the DEG websites, right? Uh, uh, Honda, for example, has a thing where it requires, it recommends on page 22 that you bring your vehicle in to be inspected after an accident and your seatbelt tension is checked, right? So really personalize our efforts is going to help you win and drive higher capture. And this is the one that really surprised me. And actually, this came to me from Mike Anderson. And uh, Dialog Tech is a company that they provide phone services for big companies. And they're saying they're seeing an increase in phone calls. So while virtual is happening, while web is happening, people in support of that are also calling in, right? So as we talk about Omnichannel, making sure that we're dialed in in all, in all aspects of this. So now we'll move on to the next chart. Uh, and we're going to talk about our second, our second item of the day is procurement. So this is traditional procurement. Uh, we write our damage appraisal. Uh, we send it to the post department. They're going to do a little shopping. Maybe they're going to go back, update the file, get approvals again, and then they do their order, right? So there's a better way of doing that. So for those of us that are using CCC1, right, we can do all of that in one stop. And we think about it, right? Why, why does it matter? Well, the estimator knows what the consumer needs. The estimator knows what the, maybe the OEM certifier is requiring, what the DRP is looking for, and also the shop production. So the, the, uh, the estimator has the ability, while they're writing a damage appraisal, to look at parts, look at availability, look at profit, make all those decisions there, basically de-skilling the parts role and just doing a checkout via multiple, via multiple vendors uh, potentially that are selected. So this is another thing, and it's probably, in my opinion, uh, the greatest thing about CCC1 today is this uh, in-place procurement tool that is resident inside of CCC. And as we think about thinking differently, thinking about being more efficient, how do we utilize this COVID uh, pandemic, right, to be stronger? This is certainly one of the areas we can shift left on. Now, item number three for us today is we're going to talk about technicians. Uh, across all of CCC, we have approximately 45,900 users that have embraced mobility. 64% uh, of y'all are utilizing Apple products. And then the minority is people like me uh, using the Android 35%. And uh, so that was your fun fact of the day. Now, as we think about the technicians, and this is another thing our suppliers on the call can help the shop, right? How many times do you see a technician leading the stall? to go ask a question, right? There is a better way. So one of the features we added for our shops that use CCC shop management, and there are no fees associated with this, is the ability to add technicians. So this allows the technician to have mobile access, mobile access to CCC1 to answer the questions that he or she may have while they're working on the vehicle. So what's an example of that? Well, you know, fast ID. We have the ability just to scan it, Scan it with our automobile and uh, fast IDs on the vehicle, and uh, we're able to pull that up. And what is really important about that is there's no personally identifiable information. 
So we're all in alignment with, with data protection there. But we have that. We can also, if I'm a technician, I can look at the damage appraisal. I can look at the repair phases. I can see parts availability, what has been ordered, what's arrived, what's due to arrive. And then for those of us that are embracing electronic quality control, what we call a CCC checklist, once again, the technician can be empowered with mandatory activities, and mandatory activities before the vehicle moves to the next, the next phase of the repair. And then if you tie that with how paid plans are uh, functioning inside of your business, it puts a really good governing, governor or controlling aspect on, uh, on, on, the, and on the technician and it powers the technician. So that's our three items for you all today. Uh, let me turn it back over to you, Mr. Anderson. All right, thanks, Mr. Chu. I appreciate it. Great insights. So ladies and gentlemen, now you're gonna get some Mike Anderson. So let's lock and load and here we go. You know, I gotta tell you right now, ladies and gentlemen, you know, absolutely, we are going through a global pandemic that is COVID. Like I don't deny that at all. It's a pain in the butt, it's affected my business, it's affected your business, it's affected kids at school, it's affected everybody. But let me tell you right now, ladies and gentlemen, we are absolutely facing another global pandemic. Absolutely. And you know what it is? It's uneducated estimators and uneducated technicians about what is needed for a safe and proper repair. You know, I'm gonna give you an example. I do estimate training for a lot of car manufacturers. I also do estimate training for private clients on behalf of Collision Advice. And one of the things that we do is when we're gonna do a, a, an estimate training session, either in person, in a shop, or virtually, is we send people a photo of a vehicle, like a Lexus, a Toyota, a Honda, an Acura, you know, or whatever, right? And what we do is we say, write an estimate to replace a quarter panel. Now, I understand you can't write a good estimate by a photo. I get that, right? But we said, at least we want to see what your knowledge assessment is of capturing not included operations, as well as research and repair procedures. So we send them a picture of something like this. And we send them a picture of the VIN number. And we say, okay, again, write an estimate on this car. And then what we do is we, ben <coughs> excuse me, we benchmark that data. Now on the right hand side, you will see, for example, body labor hours. This is the estimate that we wrote at Collision Advice, and we use all three estimating systems, CCC, Mitchell, and Autotex. Now on this quarter panel estimate replacement, we actually had almost 80 hours of body labor. Each one of these lines right here represents the estimate that the shop submitted for us for our review. And ladies and gentlemen, that's scary to me, that some people don't even have 20 hours labor on their estimate. And then no shops had paint, I mean, frame labor on there. And then we benchmarked the mechanical labor hours. And again, I've got, I wrote this estimate, I've got 45 hours of mechanical labor on my estimate, right? 45 hours. And then I've got shops that submit estimates to me that I have less than three hours mechanical labor or zero hours mechanical labor. And then, oh my gosh, we look at paint labor. Let me tell you something right now. If you're complaining to your jobber and saying, I'm not making any money on my materials, it's probably because you suck writing estimates. I mean that in love. It's probably because you suck. Oh, yeah, because you don't write a good estimate. I'm writing an estimate to replace a quarter panel. Ladies and gentlemen, I've got almost 40 hours of paint labor on this job. And I got other shops submitting estimates to me with 12 hours paint labor, 15 hours paint labor, 18 hours paint labor. And ladies and gentlemen, that's a huge gap. So what we do is we take them through the class. And when we go through the class, we say, okay, let's see how many lines you have on your estimate, including line notes and documentation for home repair procedures. And we do a comparison on this. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you right now, we have a pandemic. People are not writing accurate estimates to ensure a safe and proper repair. And I mean this in love, hear my heart. They're not writing good estimates. And I hear all kinds of excuses like, well, first of all, I didn't have enough time. Or, or I didn't really take this that serious. Or the insurance will never pay for that. Ladies and gentlemen, there are, you know what? If you don't put feather prime and block on your estimate, that's not going to kill anybody. But if you don't put an initialization after a battery's been reconnected, that could absolutely kill somebody. This is an example of the estimate we wrote on this Lexus. Notice how we're using good line notes. Ladies and gentlemen, here's the deal. <laughs> Excuse me. We're going to have more photo estimating and more virtual reinspections with insurers because of COVID. You've got to learn to document your estimate. Again, hear my heart. I mean this in love. You've got to use better line notes. Like, for example, you'll see right here on the right-hand side, you know, disconnect battery, line note, labor is to disconnect and reconnect battery negative terminal per Lexus crib bolt at 160. Document why you have to do what you have to do. 
This is another thing that I started doing on my estimates now. I put my torque specifications as a line note on this. Shout out to a guy by the name of Alex Kwong, who lives in California, owns a shop. He taught me this. I put my torque specs on there so I can make sure my technician is torquing everything back to the proper specifications. So ladies and gentlemen, we've got to start writing better estimates, right? And we take them down through and we teach them how to write these estimates. And you'll see I'm going through this, ladies and gentlemen. By the way, to replace this quarter panel on this Lexus, you will see all my lines, all my lines, all my lines. And I'm going to go through this. Ladies and gentlemen, let me just let you know right now, to replace the quarter panel on that estimate, I'm going to go to the chat panel for a minute for a second, okay? How many pages of OEM repair procedures did you think or do you think that I had to review to write the estimate? So, so here's the deal, Melissa. I just posted that in the chat panel. I would love to have people, Melissa, use their questions panel and see what kind of feedback we get. So if you can go to your questions panel, just type in for me. So replace a quarter panel on a Lexus. I had to take and research some repair procedures. I just want you to guess how many OEM repair procedures did I have to research to write that quarter panel? All right, come on, Dwayne. Dwayne, come on. You're on the big island, bro. You got to put an answer in here for me. Come on, Rory Chandler Jr. You got to put an answer in here for me. Come on. I want some answers from some of y'all. How many? Go to your questions panel and type in how many pages of OEM repair procedures did you think I had to research, right? Louis Sharp, you know, he said uh, 17. 17. Al Barnes said 50. Roy Jr. said 50 pages. All right, come on, y'all. We got 46 people on this webinar. I want to hear some answers from y'all. Lydell Phillips said 100 pages of building repair procedures. All right, come on, y'all. I want some more answers. All right, Dan Nick said 250 pages of building repair procedures. Mitzi Belt said 127. Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, Mitzi is the closest. I had 139 pages of OM repair procedures, I had a review, I had a research find, review, read, print out to give the technician just to replace that quarter panel, 132. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, did you know that it takes the average human being two minutes to read a technical document? Two minutes. So how long do you think it takes to, to, to read and research all the OM repair procedures? At the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, we have a pandemic in our industry, and that is people that are not trained and are uneducated on how to write an estimate for a safe and proper repair. And so ladies and gentlemen, here's what I'm telling you. Don't be part of the problem, be part of the solution. And that's why we at Collision Advice always say, learn to research and research to learn. Learn to utilize the OM repair procedures and then utilize the OM repair procedures to perform a safe and proper repair. So I'm gonna tell you right now, 2021, what does our industry need to do? We need to focus on learning how to utilize the OEM repair procedures to ensure safe and proper repair. Now, let's talk about the next thing that I think you need to focus on as we get through COVID and go into 2021. That is understanding your financials. First of all, there are two ways to view a profit and loss. One is loaded, where all the benefits are above the gross profit line, and one is unloaded, with all the benefits below the gross profit line. Now, if you use Axon Nobel Paint, they take and they benchmark all their shops' financials loaded, meaning all the benefits are above the gross profit line. Now, if you use BSF, Sherman Williams, Exalta, PPG, they all benchmark financials and numbers as unloaded, meaning the benefits are below the gross profit line. It's also important, ladies and gentlemen, that as you look at your financials, you know, here's something I often ask people, right? I say, I, I say, hey, Melissa. You know, how would you quality control inspect your body tech? Melissa would be like, well, I make sure the lights work and the door handles work. Okay, I got you. I'm cool with that. All right, Melissa, how do you QC your painter? Well, I make sure the paint matches and there's no runs or drips or no dirt in the paint. Cool. Melissa, how do you quality control inspect your bookkeeper or accountant? And that's exactly what I hear, silence. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to make sure that moving into 2021, you understand, number one, what an accurate chart of accounts looks like for a body shop or collision repair center. And number two is how to analyze your PL to look for areas where you're not maximizing expenses, or I'm sorry, maximizing profits. So ladies and gentlemen, we need to make sure we focus on this, right? Now, keep in mind, when you go to set up your chart of accounts, you always wanna make sure that you have accounts and sub accounts. 
I, I want everybody going to the questions panel for me. I want this to be interactive. I want you to type in the two words, accounts and sub accounts. All right, Louis Sharp, kick me off here, bro. Type in for me, Louis Sharp, accounts and sub accounts. If Jody Chandler's on this on this on this webinar, type in accounts and sub accounts. Come on, y'all. I want to make sure you're getting this. Type that in the questions panel for me. There we go, Robert Collins. Accounts and sub accounts. All right, Rory Jr., Louis Sharp. All right, y'all get it. So what do I mean by that? When you go to set up your financials, you need to have an account. An account would be labor. A sub account is body labor, paint labor, mechanical labor. An account is paint materials. An account is parts. A sub account is new parts, aftermarket, recycled. You want to make sure you set up your chart of accounts with accounts and sub accounts. And remember, whatever you have a, a, a sale for, you need to have a direct opposite where you have a cost to offset it. By the way, if you go to our website, collisionadvice.com, you go to where it says tools, forms, and links. You can actually download a sample P&L, or you can reach out to me. I'll send you a sample. Work with your bookkeeper. But at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, we need to make sure we understand our financials. <clears throat> now, let me give you another benchmark here when it comes to financials. One of the things I've learned from Ray Chu at CCC is this. We have to figure out how to eliminate human disruption. I'm going to type that in the chat panel. Eliminate human disruption. That's one of the things you need to be focused on going into 2021. Why is that? Ladies and gentlemen, 10 years ago, the ratio was like one to three. You had one admin person for every three people that worked in the body or paint shop. Today, ladies and gentlemen, it's almost one to one. I will tell you that the average body shop right now, ladies and gentlemen, is spending about 13% of their sales on non-productive employees. That means if you do $200,000 a month in sales, the average shop is spending between $20,000 to $230,000, I'm sorry, $20,000 to $23,000 a month for to pay for admin help, CSRs, estimators, et cetera. This has increased over the past few years, right? This has increased over the past few years. Um, right now, um, uh, uh, Ray Chu, can you hear me? Robert Collins just said he could not hear me. Can you hear me, Ray Chu? I can hear you. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm not sure what happened there, Robert, but uh, hopefully you'll get me back. I can hear you. All right, thank you, Melissa. So here's the deal, ladies and gentlemen. As we start to look at setting up your P&L, make sure you set up an account for like admin and then sub accounts so that you can start to benchmark and look at some things as far as what percentage of your sales you're spending on estimators, CSRs, or whatever the case may be. So we're seeing that start to grow. Now, also remember, ladies and gentlemen, if you're in the collision repair industry, you need to be on accrual-based accounting. What do I mean by that? That means you need to be adjusting your work in process or your WIP every single month. That means at the end of the month, any money you've paid out on labor or parts or sublet, you want to take and remove that off of your P&L and put it on your balance sheet as a asset. Why is that? So we have consistent gross profit. Okay? So make sure you understand whatever management system you use, CCC1, ProfitNet, Summit, Nexius, you understand how to run an accounting WIP report and how to do your adjustments. Now, here's the next thing I want to talk about, paint materials. So in the past, paint materials as a percentage of sales was always around 10%. That means if you did 200,000 in sales, you collected about 10% of that or $20,000 in paint materials. I will tell you that has moved. We are now seeing that inch up closer to 11%. Matter of fact, industry average is about 10.9%. So your goal should be about 10.9% of your sales is what you should be collecting for paint materials. What you spend or your cost should be 6% or less. That's your goal. That should be your goal. Now, let me tell you what happens. I have shops call me all the time and say, man, I'm not making any money on my paint materials. Well, the first thing I ask them is, well, how do you determine what your cost is for paint materials? And what most people do is they just take their total invoice from their jobber and they put all of that to cost of goods sold for paint materials. And ladies and gentlemen, that is a mistake. Because not every single thing we buy from our job or distributor is paint materials. Matter of fact, one of the things that we at Collision Advice do for our clients is we produce something that's called a paint materials accounting summary. Paint materials accounting summary okay so for example um our, our the clients that we have 
Uh, we work with their jobbers. Like, uh, for example, I have a client called Frank's that's a client of Steve down at Mike and Jerry's in the great state of Louisiana. And Mike, uh, what uh, Steve does for Mike and Jerry's is he sends me the data for his, uh, his shop, meaning Frank's. And what we do is we input that into a, a program, a software program, and we take all the SKU numbers and we code it to the GL code. So you can see, for example, in this specific example of a shop, let's look at the month of September, they spent $30,000 with their jobber. But you don't put all $30,000 of that to paint materials cost of goods sold. Why is that? Because $4,730 of that was allied products, sandpaper, tape, et cetera, right? Body shop supplies like body fillers, spreaders, things like that, was $1,569, $971 was detail supplies. You like for cleaning the car, that's not paint materials. 19,000 was liquid, $249 was paint materials miscellaneous, maybe things like tack rags or touch up brushes. I mean, they spent $767 on just safety items, things like paint suits and, and gloves and dust masks. That's not paint materials. And $740 was shop supplies. That's things that like, you know, like stay dry to clean up an oil mess or things like that. And then they spent $317 on small tools and $1,679 on stock parts. What is stock parts? Stock parts is items you should be charged on an estimate like seam sealer, double-sided tape, weld through primer, cavity wax. So ladies and gentlemen, here's the deal. Don't just take everything you get from your jobber and apply it to paint materials cost and goods sold. What you need to do is understand that depending on what type of job or distributor you have, you could buy things from them that could go into uh, approximately 10 to 13 or more GL accounts on your P&L. Again, if anybody wants me to do a one-on-one -on -one analysis with you on that, listen, if you're a friend of RDAs, there is no charge for that. All right. I'm not here selling anything. I want to help people. Right. So at the end of the day, if you would like me to analyze it or help you understand how to plot or set up your chart of accounts, Listen, reach out to me. We'll make sure we help you because you're a friend of RDAs. And then what we do is when, when, when we build a software program, we allow shops that if they're like, wow, what's in my Allied products? They can right click on that, open it up, and they can see everything that was in Allied. So now there's no guesswork to it. They know exactly what was posted to that account. Here's the next thing I want to talk to you about, ladies and gentlemen, is that stock parts, seam sealer, double-sided tape, weld through primer, cavity wax. None of that is paint materials. That is all things that should be charged out on an estimate. And we track that for all of our clients. Because you know what, ladies and gentlemen, if you look right here, 61% of what this shop bought from their jobber was liquid. 14% of what they bought from their jobber was allied products. But look at this, 10% of the things they bought from their jobber was stock parts. That means things they should be charging out for on the estimate. And if you take that $3,000, they should be making about a 45 or 50% gross profit on that they really should be billing out about $6,000 a month, right? If they do 100 cars, that's an average of, uh, you know, X amount of cars per, per uh, X amount of, of dollars per car. So at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, what we need to understand is we've got to make sure we understand our financials and what we're posting to payment materials, right? Again, break and look at your allied purchases, your, what you spend on masking and abrasives and mixing and how much you spend on clear and, and color and primers and all these types of things and break it out. And again, like let's look at stock parts again. I'm going to go back to that because the average shop, you actually spend about two to 4% of your total sales on things like seam sealer, double-sided tape, et cetera, that should be built out on an estimate. Now there's companies like Worth. Worth has an invoicing system. Kent has an invoicing system. 3M has the crimp tool. Use those systems to build for these items. You'll see like here, we actually measure for our shops like how much do they spend in attachment tape, which is like double-sided tape? How much on plastic repair materials? How much on grinding discs? How much on cutting wheels, seam sealer, you know, file sanding belts? We track all this. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm encouraging you to work with your team to do that. All right, I see we have a question here real quick. Uh, April White, is the 13% admin cost loaded or unloaded? That would be unloaded, ma'am. That is without benefits. So again, an average shop, let's say they're doing 200,000 a month in sales, they're probably spending between twenty to twenty-six thousand dollars a month on administrative cost, and that that is to pay CSRs estimators. That is unloaded, ma'am, without benefits. Benefits would be below the gross profit line. All right, th thank you, ma'am, for the question. That was a great question. So now I'm going to talk about diversification. So check this out, right? So a few years back, I was at a meeting up in Massachusetts, 
And the CEO of Dunkin' Donuts was there. And he told us the story about how Dunkin' Donuts aligned with Baskin Robbins. I don't know about y'all, but I love me some Dunkin' Donuts and I love me some ice cream. Like uh, ice cream and donuts just makes everything better. Can I get an amen? If y'all think ice cream and donuts makes everything better, I just want you to go to the questions panel and put in for me, amen. All right, thank you, April. Amen, Louis Sharp. Amen. You're right, Dwayne. Oh, Dwayne, you know you love some donuts, bro, right? So here's the deal, right? When I was talking to Dunkin' Donuts, Dunkin' Donuts said, here's the deal, right? We sell enough donuts and coffee in the morning that it covers all of our overhead costs, pays all the bills, and we make some profit. So they said, but our building is sitting empty the rest of the day, and our building is sitting empty at night. What can we do to generate more sales? So what they did is they purchased Baskin Robbins. So keep in mind, Dunkin' Donuts, they made enough money selling donuts and bagels and coffee that it covered all their overhead costs and still made them money. So now any money they make at night selling ice cream, we call that flow through dollars. So I'm gonna go to the chat panel here, right? Flow through dollars, all right? Any money they made outside of their Dunkin' Donuts business went right to the bottom line because their overhead cost was already done. And then what happened was Baskin Robbins took off. And they said, look, our parking lot's sitting empty during the day. We've already paid the rent. We've already paid the electricity. We've already paid the business insurance. Well, you know what? What can we do to generate income during the middle of the day? And what did they do? They purchased to-go sandwiches. So what they did is they figured out that if they can create revenue, even outside of their normal business hours of Dunkin' Donuts, assuming Dunkin' Donuts covers their overhead, more money will flow to the bottom line. Now, let me tell you about some of the advantages they see. Here's what Dunkin', and bear with me, y'all, because I'm going somewhere with this, right? This whole Dunkin' Donuts stuff is going to tie back into the body shop industry. Stay with me here. Stay with me, right? So here's what Dunkin' Donuts found. They found that, number one, is the idea of co-branding their stores, like Dunkin' Donuts, To-Go Sandwich, and Baskin Robbins, could serve customers around the clock. So you get coffee and donuts in the morning, sandwich for lunch, ice cream in the evening. But here was the deal, right? They wanted to find a reason for customers to come to them all day. And again, any additional sales from to-go sandwiches at Baskin Robbins went straight to the bottom line. Now, let me share this with you, right? Um, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of dealership body shops. And one of the things I've learned from dealership body shops is something called absorption rate, all right? I want you all to go to the questions panel. Just type that in for me, please. Type those words in for me. I want you a little interactive here. Type in for me the words absorption rate. Absorption rate. There you go, Louis Shop. Absorption rate. So what is absorption rate, right? Here's what absorption rate is. Dealerships feel that if they can make enough money off a of service and parts to absorb the overhead cost, then anything they make off of new car sales goes right to the bottom line. And then if you throw a body shop in there, any money they make from the service department, from the parts department and the body shop, if that covers the overhead costs, then anything from the new car sales goes right to the bottom line. Because here's the reality. It is becoming much more competitive to sell cars. The profits that they used to make selling cars is not there anymore, right? They don't make as much profit because of online marketing. You can buy a car online and you can Google different prices. So car sale profits have shrunk and they're under a lot of pricing pressures. And by the way, just so you know, the goal of a dealership is to have an absorption rate higher than 100%. But here's what they found. If we can use service in the collision center and parts to absorb the overhead costs and they're profitable, then we are more resilient to vehicle pricing pressures. So I just want to ask you a question. If you're a collision repair center and you're on this webinar right now, are you feeling insurance company pressures on severity? Just type in yes or no. Yes or no. Are you feeling um Pressures from insurance companies in regards to severity. Just type in yes or no. All right, some people said yes, some people said no. We got another yes. Come on, give me some answers, y'all. 44 people on this webinar want some answers. Yes, we got another yes, another yes. Okay, so here's the deal. As long as we just do collision repair, we will always feel the pressures when an insurance company tries to control severity. But if we can find some additional revenue sources outside of our normal collision repair operating hours, we now are not um, is, is affected or impacted by sales downturns like COVID, right? 
like when COVID happens and claims count declines, if we have another, you know, business model or another business option, we might be able to offset that, right? And what that does gives us the ability to thrive and not to survive. Now, stay with me because I'm going somewhere here with this, right? My goal for you is to challenge you to think outside the box. So please stay with me on this, okay? So here's the deal. When you think about Baskin Robbins, Dunkin' Donuts, to-go sandwiches, what's that look like in the collision world? It's like, okay, we're gonna do collision repair work during the day, then maybe I do calibrations in the evening. Maybe I do collision repair during the day, then the evening I do pre-purchase inspections for somebody that wants to buy a new car. What we need to do is start thinking about, ladies and gentlemen, the simple word, and that is diversification. Let's start with calibrations, first of all. Calibrations absolutely is the next Everest in our building. It's the next Everest, right? So here's the deal. First of all, the average body shop stall is about three to 400 square feet. All right, average body shop stall, three to 400 square feet. An average calibration stall is about 1,200 to 1,800 square feet. So to do a calibration on like a blind spot monitor, adaptive cruise control, a windshield, it takes about three to four times as much space as a regular body shop stall, right? Now, most body technicians are 135 to 150% efficient. Most calibration technicians are only gonna be about 80 to 100% efficient. So here's the deal, right? If you wanted to get into calibrations to just do one calibration at a time, you're gonna need about 1,800 to 2,000 square feet. If you wanna do two or three calibrations at a time, you're gonna need about four to 5,000 square feet. Now you might say, Mike, I don't have the money to go spend to build an additional 4,000 square feet. Or if you're in Hawaii, where real estate's expensive, you might not be able to find that additional space. But here's what we can do. If we do collision repair work during the day, can we pull all those cars out in the evening? In the evening, we do calibrations. And by the way, for all of you jobbers, paint jobbers and distributors on this webinar, they have to have a floor coating that goes on the floor that is non-glare, and they've got to have the ability to write on it with a dry erase mark. So any of you that are in the coatings industries, you're a job or distributor or paint manufacturer, I would start identifying now. Calibrations, you have to be able to write on the floor. It takes a special coating. Each paint manufacturer always has that. So start figuring that out and marketing that to your shops, right? Now, again, your floor has to be level. You also don't want to want a lot, of, a lot of windows. You can't have a lot of light, light shining in because it will mess up your calibrations. And you can't have any metal, no metal shelves, no poles in the way. But at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, as we start thinking about calibrations, ladies and gentlemen, it is absolutely an opportunity for us to be, calibrations could be the Baskin Robbins ice cream to Dunkin' Donuts. Now, just so you know, our company, Collision Advice, we recently partnered with Aztec and Nissan Infinity to build out the first hands-on calibration training for an OEM manufacturer that is specific to collision repair specialists. We ran the pilot meaning that like the first class in Jacksonville, Florida last month, you will see on the left-hand side, uh, this is Brad Wiersma from uh, Paducah, Kentucky, Randy's Body Shop. Uh, this right here is a gentleman from Daycoo's Auto Body up in Pennsylvania. And what we do is we have four brand new Nissans, one brand new Infiniti, and we have uh, one technician per car. And this is the target. And these are the technicians we actually did hands-on training. That training is going to get announced and released in January. So listen to me. If you are a Nissan or Infinity certified shop, you are going to have the ability to send someone to a two-day hands-on calibration course for Nissan Infinity. And if you get out, you will be certified. You'll be able to be by the targets. And now what can you do? You can market calibrations to any rental car companies. They can use somebody else to fix their cars, but you can just do the calibrations. You can market this to dealerships. Look at a Ford F-150. To do a calibration on a Ford F-150 mirror, the target is four feet wide by 40 feet long. Most dealerships don't have that much room in service, but you could offer that and do that after hours. And here's the great thing about calibrations. Guess what? It's labor and it's a mechanical labor operation where most people are going to have a 65 to 70% gross profit percentage. So think about this being your basket robins in the evening. You pull all your cars out of your body shop and now you can do calibrations and offer this to other shops, offer it to dealerships, offer it to glass companies. And here's the other thing. Let's say somebody gets a windshield replaced and the windshield company says, hey, go see ABC Body Shop. They can do your calibration. And now you do it for them in an evening when it's convenient for them. But guess what else you're doing? As a collision repairer, you're now making them know who your business is. So if they ever have an accident in the future, they're going to come to you. So it's also a marketing strategy. Matter of fact, we at Collision Advice, we surveyed body shops. We had a response 
from a body shop in every single state except for the state of Wyoming. And 74% of the shops we surveyed said they would love to send somebody to hands-on OEM training. And we asked them, what OEMs would you like to go to? Honda and Acura. Well, guess what? Scott Caboose at Honda and Acura has built a hands-on calibration training class for certified collision repair pro first shops. That will be launched in 2021 for pro first shops on how to use a Honda Acura factory scan tool, Honda Acura calibration targets, and do calibrations. Toyota Lexus has developed a class. We've developed a class for Nissan Infinity. So the training is going to be out there, ladies and gentlemen. So take advantage of it. All right. By the way, if anybody is interested in sending one of your technicians to the Nissan Infinity certification training program, number one is it is in Jacksonville, Florida. I understand it's a long flight from Hawaii. Number two, it is limited to only 10 people per class because it's two people per car and there's five cars and each technician will have to complete five hours of pre-work e-learning modules and also they will have to do five calibrations before they pass the class. At the end of the day, our company Collision Vice delivers the training. If anyone is interested in getting a technician registered for the first classes we do next year, reach out to me personally and I'll be glad to hook you up. Also, if you are a job or distributor and you wanna share that with your shops, and your shops are interested in sending someone, feel re free to reach out to me. I've got your back, I'm on your team, and I'll help you make it happen, all right? Now, some people like to sublet out their calibrations, but remember, ladies and gentlemen, that's mostly labor. And number two is you don't really know if they're doing it properly. And if they don't, you're still liable. So I would encourage you to open your mind to calibrations. Now, let's talk about glass work. You look at this, every GM windshield you buy, there's a sticker on it, look what the sticker says. To assure the proper function of the ADAS system, this windshield is necessary to recalibrate after replacing. Ladies and gentlemen, get into the glass business. Learn how to install glass. Send your people to glass training. Get with your job or distributor and say, what kind of equipment or training could you offer in this local area, right? And offer glass training because you need to bring your glass work in-house to ensure it's done properly. It help you with cycle time, but it's also another profit center. Let's talk about electric vehicles. Electric vehicles are gonna be the diesel of the future. Ladies and gentlemen, do you know between 2012 and 2016, the United States had a 32% annual growth just in electric vehicles? Did you also know that one of the things that hotels and restaurants and stores are doing is they're installing electric vehicle charging stations. Why? So the consumer will come there to get their vehicle charged. And now they'll, you know what? They might wander into the store or restaurant and get a bite to eat or buy something from the store. Now we don't sell anything, but what about if we took and put electrical vehicle charging stations at our facilities so if consumers needed a charge, they could come there. Guess what happens? If you have an electrical or EV charging station at your place of business, guess what? You automatically show up on these apps that all these electrical vehicle owners use to find a charging station. And now if you're on the app, they come there to charge their car, guess what? If they ever wreck their car, guess what they're gonna do? They're now going to say, hey, I remember body shop, I'm going to get my car fixed at. And they're going to assume that because you had an EV charging station, you know about EV vehicles. And now what you've done is you position yourself to market your business to electrical vehicles, because that's a whole other niche that we should be going after in the future, right? Let's talk about the service drive. Many of you may be a dealership body shop or you do work for a dealership. Did you know that 41% of all vehicles go through the service lane at a dealership or need a, some kind of body work? And did you know that's an average RO of $900 to $1,200? And these are drivable vehicles. They have a higher gross profit and they're quick cycle time jobs, two or three days. Let's look at an average dealership. Average dealership does, say, um, about 100 cars a day through the service lane, 21 working days in a month. That's 2,100 vehicles a month. Take that times 41% of those need body work. That's 800 cars. If we just capture 15% of those cars, just 15%, that's $1.5 million in potential revenue. Now, Mr. Chu, I know you're still with me here, sir, but let me ask you a question. Could they absolutely implement CCC's photo estimating app with dealership service lanes, sir? Could they? Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, sir, yes. So, ladies and gentlemen, here's the deal. You've got to tap into photo estimating. Why? Because it is an opportunity for us to collaborate with a service lane to capture more work if you do work for a dealership or owned by a dealership. That's $1.5 million of potential revenue of work that's customer paying, not insurance, going through a dealership on a monthly basis. Let's talk about mechanics. Uh, can, can I just add one thing? One thing Please, that I like, Jump in, I brother. Could, let's go back to what, 
one screenshot. So some of the deals, Mike, that you and I work with, right? Um, um, the first thing to do is to observe the service lane and how the folks are engaging, right? Because this collision repair is a little bit alien at first. So the people that have done this really well, they studied the service lane, then they then they spent a little time with it, and then utilize like uh, different aspects of it to educate and to help do it. So it is it is a little bit it, it seems easy, but it's process driven. So spend a little time investigating it because, Mike, to your point, every time we run case studies, your data comes back entirely accurate, sir. So great point. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chu. So, ladies and gentlemen, again, if you're doing work for a dealership, you're in my dealership. On average, you have a $1.5 million repair potential that you need to be strategizing on how can I get those vehicles into my shop. Now, let's talk about mechanical. If you look at body labor, paint labor, mechanical labor, frame labor, the one that's going to grow the most in the future is mechanical. Every single vehicle manufacturer out there now requires seatbelt inspections, steering column inspections, calibrations, initializations after you reconnect the battery. Here's what I will tell you. If you're doing $150,000 or more a month in collision repair revenue, you have enough work to support a full-time mechanic. And again, ladies and gentlemen, thinking about the whole Dunkin' Donuts to go's, you know, sandwiches, uh, Baskin Robbins model, this is something else we can do to bring clients to the door, diversification, add additional flow through dollars for profit, but also, ladies and gentlemen, to create awareness so the customers know who we are, they need a collision repair shop in the future. I love this one right here. Several of my clients, what they've done is they've become authorized installers for Tire Rack. A consumer goes and orders their tires from Tire Rack. Tire Rack drop ships them to your shop. And you can be registered as an independent installer. Now, here's the deal. You might say, well, you know what, Mike? Man, you don't make that much money installing tires. You're right. You might make 15, 20 bucks to install a tire. But if I install 10 customers' tires a month and just one of them ends up needing a body shop, and that's an average R of $3,000 times a 43% gross profit. That's about roughly $1,200. And if I've got my overhead covered, that's going to flow right to the bottom line. So at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, consider what can we do to follow the Dunkin' Donuts, Baskin Robbins to go sandwiches model. Think about that, right? Here's another option, right? I have a client that is a, a shop down in Florida. He uses CCC photo estimating. He called Enterprise and he said, hey, how do you guys handle your total losses? They said, well, if we think we have a card to total loss, uh, what we do is we pay this guy 350 bucks. He comes out, writes an estimate, and then we total it. And the guy's like, look, how about if you just send me photos and I'll send you this app. You send me photos of anything you think is a total loss. I'll write it for you. I'll only charge you 150. Guess what? That shop's pay now writing enough total losses for the rental car companies to actually offset the pay of an entire additional admin person to handle photo estimating. So think outside the box. Here's another one. What about pre-purchase inspections? You offer to consumers, hey, if you're thinking about buying a car, bring it to us. We'll do a pre-purchase inspection. You can offer this in the evenings again. Now what happens is if I can do a couple of pre-purchase inspections and I charge for that to help inspect a car before somebody buys it, I've now also extended my hours because my overhead's already covered. And now I might be able to generate more traffic to capture more keys for people that can't come during the normal business hours. So again, some other things for us to think about. So I'm going to wrap up here with you with one last gold nugget. Now, here's the deal. I, I, listen, I don't want you to blow smoke. If you think that what I'm going to share with you is some smoking hot stuff, I want you to give me an amen. If you don't think it's all that impressive, I just want you to type in, that dog don't hunt. All right? Yeah. For my friends in Hawaii, that's a new saying. You have an amen or a that dog don't hunt. All right? So here's the deal. What about total losses? Most people, when they get total losses, you know what they do? They charge storage. They charge teardown. They charge admin fees. How about this? How about you charge and ask the customer, do you want me to erase all your personal data in your car? Think about how many people take and sync their phone with their vehicle. Well, the car's a total loss. We have to erase all their contact information where they sync their phone. If not, all their personal information is in there. What about if they use their GPS and navigation unit and they have their home address saved in there? Do you think they want that going out in the world when it gets sold as a salvage piece? What about if their garage door opener codes are in there? So ladies and gentlemen, how about when a car is a total loss, we ask the consumer or vehicle owner, would you like us to erase all your personal data in your car? And then if you're not sure how to do that, go to the owner's manual and tell you how to do it. So let me ask you a question. I want you to be honest. 
How many of you on a total loss have ever considered or thought about erasing the customer's personal data? Just own it. Own it. Own it. Own it. Own it. I just want it. Louis Sharp gave me an amen. All right. I want to hear everybody else. Do you think, do you think that's a, a dog, that dog don't hunt or you think that's an amen? Bill Newman gave me an amen. All right. Come on, y'all. I want to hear from some other people. Come on. You know, my self-esteem's low. Build me up a little bitty, all right? Robert Collins said, that dog don't hunt. All right, Robert, I'd love to get some feedback from you, Robert. So, Robert, do you believe it's not necessary? Do you believe an insurance company would pay way for it? Or what are you thinking, Robert Collins? I want some feedback from you, brother. All right, thank you, Mr. Steven. Because, ladies and gentlemen, here's the deal. I'm not even talking about whether you do it, charge for it or not charge for it, but it's something we need to offer the customer. Because in today's vehicles, right? In today's vehicles, so here's the deal, ladies and gentlemen. We need to make sure that we ask the customer you want your data interrupt, uh, you know, removed, right? Because at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, it's something that in today's world we have to make sure we do. So, ladies and gentlemen, we had a lot of information come at you pretty fast. So let's just go ahead and do this. What should you be doing after this webinar? Understand COVID is getting ready to spike, claims count's going to decline. So you got to focus on capture rate. You got to focus on when you write an estimate, following up with a customer and saying, when can we get you scheduled in? You've got to make sure, ladies and gentlemen, that you've got to focus on also following up on any insurance assignments in a timely manner. Number two, there is a pandemic, ladies and gentlemen, there is a pandemic that people are not writing proper estimates for a safe and proper repair. So you've got to be part of the solution which is research and repair procedures, getting training for your staff. Also, think about Baskin Robbins to go sandwiches and Dunkin' Donuts. How can you diversify your business to offset the severity pressures from insurance companies as well as claims count decline? Think about what you can do. Get into the calibrations business. Maybe consider doing glass work. Consider offering mechanical work. Consider doing pre-purchase inspections. Make sure you understand your financials. And make sure you understand that not everything you buy from your paint job or distributor is paint materials. A lot of those things are shop supplies, items you should be charging for the estimate. At the end of the day, it all boils down, ladies and gentlemen, to education and training. So, Melissa, I think we've wrapped it up. Uh, we came at you kind of hard today, brought it kind of hard for y'all. But I'd like to see if anybody has any questions, Melissa, any questions. Robert Collins, uh, if you give me a call on my cell phone, 301-535-3333. I will be more than happy to talk to you offline, sir, about how to get paid for that. So um, feel more than happy to. Melissa, any questions, ma'am? There you go. I don't see any others. Um, I just want to say we'll follow up by sending everyone Mike's contact information and the recording of this webinar. Uh, we really appreciate everyone taking time out of the busy days to join us. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Ray. Um, take care, everyone, and we'll be in touch with future training opportunities. Everybody have a great okay. day. Hey, love and appreciate you all. Thanks, Melissa. And if we don't talk to you all, have a Merry Christmas.